today is, uh, uh, let's say, a class in which I will try to, to summarize uh, everything that I do in a whole uh, information systems and organizations course. I usually teach that course over a semester, so it's a 60-hour course, it's a three-credit course, uh, very long course. I've been teaching information systems uh, in, and organizations for possibly over 20 years. Um, so it's, it's uh, a course that has, let's say, I've learned a lot, you know, that uh, uh, teachers and professors learn a lot by teaching, so uh, I learned a lot by teaching that, that course. And let's say for at least the, the first 10 years that I taught uh, that course, although we were already emphasizing a lot of uh, possibilities of using information systems uh, as uh, collective intelligence tools, uh, we, we were not using that term, we were not using that expression, and in fact, our authors were not using that uh, um, expression either, right? So nobody knew that we were talking about collective intelligence, but at least since the 90s, uh, many researchers in information systems and even many practitioners in the industry had already understood that there was a possibility of using our information technologies to collect uh, information from the market and making sense out of it. Right? So many uh, business researchers in IS, information systems, were already uh, considering that we could change the way we, we did business, uh, at least uh, change the way we did marketing. Uh, instead of broadcasting our, our marketing campaign, we could build it together with, uh, with the customers, involving the customers in the many stages of development of a product and even the production of the, the product and so on and so forth. So, it's been a while since we started talking about co-production or co-creation and things like that in business. Uh, and co-production, co-creation uh, are expressions of collective intelligence because when you, you have, well, that, that uh, how do we say that prefix, co means together, right? So creating together, uh, producing something together, together with whom? Not with our colleagues, the other employers of the organization. Producing together with the customer. The customer being involved in a way that you make sure that whatever the product ends up to be at the end of the process is going to be much more aligned to the customer's interests uh, than one uh, would uh, expect if it was just something that was made by the, the, let's say, the employees of that firm and pushed out of the gates of the factory uh, in the hope that someone would uh, find that interesting and would buy it at the end. Right? So again, uh, and, and when I say that I try to summarize a whole course of information systems and, and organizations in one class here, I want to show you that many of these papers written in the 90s were already discussing collective intelligence, although we didn't know uh, at that stage, or at least or we knew that we were talking about collective intelligence, but we didn't even have the vocabulary to talk about. Right? Um, one important thing, uh, I think I mentioned that in our first class, is that collective intelligence as a, a, an area of study still has to develop its own vocabulary. Right? We still have to make sure that when we are dealing with collective intelligence, we are using the same terms to mean the same things. And this is still a huge problem uh, for us because you will see uh, over the, you know, the readings that we will be doing in the, for, for this class, you will see that different uh, researchers, different, or dif different people are using sometimes the same terms, the same expressions, to mean relatively different things, right? So sometimes one expression meaning different things, and, and other times uh, uh, um, also the lack of uh, uh, an expression to make a distinction between different things. Um, I always remember when uh, I was introduced to a difference that Peter Drucker brought to business uh, when he decided that he was going to use uh, the words efficiency and effectiveness as two different, uh, ha having two different meanings. Even today, if we look at the dictionary, what is the difference between being efficient and being effective, right? Uh, in Portuguese, we have the, the words eficiência and eficácia. What is the difference, right? Uh, if we don't have people like Peter Drucker that go there and say, okay, we have two, we, we have sometimes several words that are used sort of uh, interchangeably that you can, uh, but uh, we need, there are different concepts that need to be uh, better explained and we need vocabulary for that. Peter Drucker created then this slightly different meaning for the two words. Uh, in fact, it was his, at least to my understanding, uh, maybe, maybe uh, he, he was inspired by someone else, but he was the first one that I saw 
you know, trying to make sure that there were two different concepts there. One of them that he called efficiency was to do uh, something right. Efficiency is what engineers seek in their in their their work, doing always something according to the right procedure, right? Having a method or a methodology or a, a procedure that is followed to ensure that starting from uh, a specific input, you get always to the same output, right? Engineering is about that. Engineering in general, or, uh, of course, I'm oversimplifying it here, but it says I, I have an input, I have a process, and then I get to, to an output. And engineers improve the process to make sure that we always get the right result from the, 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 the means and the, and the raw materials that we had, right? Uh, Peter Drucker started questioning if uh, what engineers were doing was always right. Of course, turning something into something else, uh, and of course, turning something that has little value in, into something else that has more value, uh, and making sure that you do that in a very precise way that can be repeated over time, so that you're always sure that you're getting more value at the end, uh, uh, is efficient in the sense that uh, uh, it, it is doing right what we have to do, but his question was, are we doing the right thing? Is what the, the, the process, well, is, is what the, the, the engineer try, is trying to achieve the right thing to be achieved? Arguably, basically, of course, he was a, a, a researcher in, in business, so are the customers still interested in what that process is, is providing them with, right? So effectiveness related to doing the right thing. So notice, efficiency, uh, doing doing something right, doing doing it the, the proper way, and effectiveness, uh, doing the right thing. Of course, the two things are very important, but they are very distinct, right? Uh, we we can be very efficient in building something that uh, customers don't want any longer, and then uh, although we are doing that right, precisely as expected, the result is going to be a pile of waste of uh, garbage because nobody will be interested in that. Well, I'm, I'm talking about this differentiation that Peter Drucker uh, created between two terms that in the, in the dictionary uh, had the same meaning. I mean, even today, if you go to uh, a dictionary, and if this dictionary has not been influenced by the research in business over the last 30 or 40 years, it will probably still say efficiency is the same as effectiveness, right? Or about the same, or whatever. Uh, but if we want to be rigorous, and if we want to, express, uh, to exchange ideas with other people that are able to understand these differences, it's important to have the vocabulary. We need the vocabulary in collective intelligence. Uh, we need people like you who are interested in this topic to, when you develop your research, and of course if your research involves uh, collective intelligence, that you dig into the slight differences that appear among the different uh, interpretations of different authors and start making distinctions. Uh, and start trying to help us build this uh, vocabulary that helps us to, to talk to one another and understand our, what we're talking about. This still, well, it's much better than it was uh, uh, 15 years ago, but we're still very, you, you'll see, if you, if you get a little confused sometimes and you think, gee, I think that this guy is talking about something that the other author there would not consider collective intelligence, right? I think it's probably different types of uh, collective intelligence that needs to go into different boxes somehow. Uh, and and we, we have to, 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 to work on that together, the, the research community will, will have to keep trying to improve the vocabulary because only when we have good vocabulary uh, we can share ideas in a way that we do not create confusion. Right? There's still a lot of confusion here. Okay, uh, but anyway, uh, we, uh, I think we have already organized a little bit of this, uh, and it will show that, uh, for example, nowadays when we, when we discuss crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing uh, is for some authors collective intelligence. And for others, they say, well, it's, it, it's not under my little umbrella of what collective intelligence uh, holds. Uh, because um, uh, uh, well, th if, if your, let's say, if your um, definition of collective intelligence only involves collectives working together to build something that is going to be good for the collective, you will leave a lot of uh, what other authors call collective intelligence out of the, let's say, out of your studies, right? Uh, but of course, it depends on the definition that we are using. It's, it's, uh, on the other hand, it's important that we start using definitions that allow for the agreement among different researchers, right? So we start, the, the, the more people we have that are, that are studying a, a specific area, 
the more we'll have people say, well, I accept this kind, this this definition, and, and, and the more people accept the same definition, that starts becoming the let's say the the rule for everyone. Okay. Well, anyway, having said that, uh, uh, let's uh, we, we we don't have that that long uh, time. We have only uh, about two hours to do the entire IS uh, and organizations course. So let's uh, focus on it. Uh, uh, I I asked you to read uh, a few papers, uh, which are uh, papers that definitely discuss collective intelligence without mentioning it, right? Uh, the first one that you, you had there was Henderson and Ben Katerman. Uh, let me see if I can show it uh, here on the screen. And I will have to change scenes here so that you see the paper. Henderson and, uh, well, Vin Katerman and Henderson, uh, I, I never know, I, I know that one of them was the, the I, I think that they, 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 they worked together in many papers, uh, but I, I, be, I do believe that one of them was uh, the advisor of the other in a PhD thesis in the, in the 80s or early 90s. Uh, but anyway, that doesn't matter so much. For us, what matters here is that, well, they were discussing real strategies for virtual organizing. Well, this also makes me think that when someone these days talks about digital transformation as being something new, out of the blue, right? Something that we started discussing, uh, maybe some, some firms started discussing after or during the pandemic, we have to do some digital transformation so that we can benefit from the potential of information technologies in having a stronger business. Uh, I mean, you go back to Van Katerman and Henderson and you see that they were saying this back in, I think it's, a, I'm not sure, this is a 94 paper, 98, let me see here, 98. In, in, this was published in 1998, which means that it was probably written in 19, 1996 or around that, because it usually in academic uh, journals it takes about two years for a paper to, to, to be published, right? It has to be reviewed by the peers and so on and so forth. Of course, here we're talking about a paper that was published on Slow Management Review. Slow Management is a, a, a journal by the MIT, but it's not a, really a research journal. It's not a it's an academic journal in the sense that it's published by uh, a university, but it is already uh, a journal that is published focused on people in the market, right? So it's not, you will see that uh, these guys here, well, from the 90s until today, we have already even changed the style that we write our papers, but they, uh, the, the paper is not what we would call a, a, uh, a theory-based uh, applied paper in which you go to the field, you, you, you have a, uh, let's say you have a hypothesis, and then you find a, you think of a methodology to, to let's say, to try and, and figure out if your hypothesis is right or wrong, and then you go to the fields, let's say you, you, you go to a, a company or to a, a set of companies and you check what is happening there and then you come back and, and get a conclusion. You will not see, for example, most of the authors that I show here that, that, that present their, their papers in, in journals like the Slow Management Review or Harvard Business Review, uh, journals like that, they're not so interested in telling us about their methodology because they are already f a little more focused on the industry. They want to have an impact on the industry and, and not on other academics. But many times, in order to write these papers, they first had to develop their research, right? Uh, which was then published in a more academic uh, journal. So I'm, I'm saying that because, of course, whatever we read in a master's or doctoral program, we, we want to have that as a sample of, or, of way of writing our own thesis and, and our dissertations, even for, for students, the, the undergrad students here that have to write a final, let's say, work. Um, uh, we always write, you, you know, we, 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 we always tend to, to write a, a, a piece of, uh, of work that uh, involves some theory and some practice together, but there's always a methodolo methodological session, section where you will tell exactly how you you collected your data and, 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 and how you analyzed your data to make sure that the results that you obtained with your study uh, make sense not only to you but make sense also to other researchers that will say well this study was conducted in a serious way so I can uh, accept these results as being uh, true or at least as being true unless uh, until someone proves them wrong in the future right we uh, one of the differences between research that we do following the scientific methods and other beliefs that we have in, in life is that here we, we have to test. There is always a, 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 we have to follow some strict methodolo methodological procedures 
that are understood by others and the others agree that it's a reasonable way of doing it. And then we get to a true, uh, to, to an answer to a, let's say, to results that will be there until, uh, well, that they may be reinforced by other researchers that do similar research and, and get results that are similar to ours, or they may also be, in the, in the future, they may be distrusted because others say, oh, look, uh, they, what they did there, I, I tried to repeat here and I don't get to the same results. So uh, our truth in science is always a temporary truth. We have already thought in science, of course science has changed a lot over time, but we have already thought that the, the, the world was flat. And then uh, after that we thought, well, we are, we're not flat, we are, we are round, but uh, we are, all other, um, let's say, um, stars rotate ar around the Earth. And look, it, it made sense because the, the, the method to, to describe that was, well, you know, I, I see the sun uh, appear at one, one end of my horizon and going down at the other end. So we already have this theory that uh, the, 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 the Earth is round. So it seems that the, the sun is going around. Is that a reasonable uh, hypothesis? In, in, uh, why we do not prove it wrong? Yes, and, and, and mankind believed that the sun orbited uh, Earth for quite a while. Then after that, with more studies and everything, they said, well, look, it may be the other way around. Um, it may be the, the Earth that uh, rotates around the Sun, and maybe the, but of course that wouldn't explain the Sun rising at one end and, 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 and setting at the other, at the other side. Uh, maybe, uh, and then, then the, there was the theory that the, the, the Earth also rotated around itself. So we, we're building uh, more, uh, more theory that explains, that tries to explain things that the previous theory didn't explain. And sometimes we have to, to make sure that we, we just have to disregard the previous uh, uh, theory because it, it, it really doesn't, doesn't explain important things that we now realize that happen. Uh, but we have to build a new theory and it will be there while, uh, uh, while it's not questioned, or at least it's not questioned by a large number of researchers building a new space for a new theory to, to appear. So what I'm trying to say here is uh, we do not have any, we shouldn't have any dogmas in science. We don't have truth that are forever. We have uh, relative truth that uh, will be there uh, until someone proves uh, that wrong or, or un unable to explain a, a, a more complex uh, process or even that process that we thought that was simple, we noticed that it's not as simple and, and so on and so forth. We as researchers, we are always looking for that and we are very, and it's important to have uh, very well explained procedures, methodological procedures, because uh, others have to understand how we got to our conclusions, right? So, all of that to say that some of these papers, mainly these that are written in, in very good journals, as, as the, the Zone Management Review, uh, as Harvard Business Review, and, and some, some other journals that will be here, when you don't see the methodological procedures, it's basically because this is, is not written for researchers, it's written for the, 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 the real world, for, for people who can use that afterwards, right? And then you may, may say, well, but aren't we researchers here? Shouldn't we be exposed to, to their original research? Uh, well, when, when I want to do this in you know, a whole course of information systems in organizations in one class, uh, I would say, well, I just want, to, what I have to prove, what I want to, to, to show to you today is that collective intelligence was already there in the discussion of what people were, were studying in the 90s, uh, at least, right? Uh, so if anyone is really interested in, in knowing how Penka Truman and Henderson got to the ideas that they are proposing here, not as scientists any longer, but as promoters of science. What they're doing here is they're, they're making sure that they, they, that they show the results of uh, their research and they're not so concerned with the, the method any longer. So accept that uh, here because our discussion is not about if they were right or wrong, it's mainly uh, about, well, was what they were discussing collective intelligence or not, right? So let's see what they were saying here in Real Strategies for Virtual Organizing. These guys build a model, this very, this model that appears here in, in uh, figure one. Uh, some of you who have taken other courses with me, you will see that I always fit this information systems course in one class, regardless of what you're doing, because I think that these guys in the 90s were doing, were showing us where we would be in 2023 or, uh, or the, let's say 25 years later, uh, even if we're, if we're saying that we're doing new things when we talk about digital transformation. Digital, th this was digital transformation. The digital transformation that many comp companies were desperately trying to, to perform during the pandemic was already in this uh, 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 module here that includes 
three vectors uh, of use, using technology, information technology, to improve business that was proposed in the 90s, right? Uh, what are their, their main uh, uh, vectors here? Uh, they, they, they claim that there was, th 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 that information technology could help them uh, improve their interaction with customers. It is obvious to us that information technology can do that, right, in 2023, 20, right? Uh, in the 90s, many companies uh, thought that technology was either too expensive or too difficult or simply that they were just saying, well, we've done our business the way we do for 20, 30 years. We're not going to change it only because there is some fancy new technology, right? But these guys were trying to show, look, this is not a fancy new technology. This is, a, this is a, the possibility of you to interact with your customers and, 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 and benefit from that because uh, you provide your customers with a remote experience with your products and services. Is this uh, collective intelligence? No. This is actually provide, provide, provide a remote experience with your products and services. Belongs to the old way of doing things. We can broadcast, we can market our, our products to customers and show them what we, have, we do. So it's basically we do it and you consume it as in the past. But look, the, the second stage, of course, this stage is necessary for a first uh, connection with the, with, with, with the customer. And of course, it was much cheaper to do this this way than uh, uh, keep uh, paying global or any TV broadcaster to broadcast their, their advertisement on the news time and, and paying uh, a, a huge amount of money for that, right? So they, they said it's, there, there's a cheaper way of providing customers with a remote experience that will, of course, notice that providing customers with a remote experience already allows customers to be a little more familiar with the product before they see the product on the shelf of the supermarket, for example, right? So that when they go there, they can buy the product uh, straight away because they already know about it. But there's no collective intelligence here, I agree. But look at the next stage, dynamic customization. What does, what does uh, dynamic customization mean? It means that the product is going to be customized. Customized is not the same as personalized, right? Uh, there's a difference. Uh, uh, a product, when a product is personalized, it means that it is built from scratch to, to a, a customer, right? For example, when uh, an art, art craftsman of the Middle Ages went there to measure the foot of the king in order to make some new shoes for the king, those shoes were designed for that foot specifically. So notice there is no product that is pushed to the market. The, the our, our craftsmen uh, of, the, of the past, and even today, uh, people that do um, our craftsmen um, work, uh, they, they do it after they, 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 they have a contact with the customer and they do something in a very personalized way for that customer. Uh, of course, the Industrial Revolution told us that this is not a very e efficient way of doing things. It may be very effective, because we will be doing exactly what that person needs, but it may not be efficient because it's going to be too, too expensive. In fact, uh, for most of the time until the, the Industrial Revolution, most humans uh, walked around bare feet all the time. We, we, we couldn't afford having shoes because shoes were, uh, let's say, a, a luxury for the kings and, and the dukes and, I don't know, only, only uh, royal people could have access to that because it was the process of doing of, of building shoes was not efficient. You needed someone to go there, take the measures of someone's foot, foot prepare uh, a pro possibly a mold. I don't know. Do it uh, in a personalized way for that person. Uh, the industrial revolution told us that uh, if, we, if we try to do personalized items, uh, we we cannot be we can be effective, but we cannot be efficient. And if we want to support a large uh, uh, number of customers, we needs to be efficient first. This is why production engineering was so important during the whole industrial revolution, right? It was very important to be efficient. Almost more important than being effective. Uh, at the end, you know, what happened was, uh, well, the, 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 the engineer decided it was more efficient to have just four sizes of shoes, small, small, medium, large, and extra large, for example, and the customer would have to fit their, their fit, feet inside that, you know, uh, in order for, for the customer to be able to afford, uh, the customer would either have a shoes that were too tight or too loose. Uh, so never personalized. In fact, not even customized. 
because customized means trying to give the customer the impression that the product is personalized, uh, which means you do most of the, the, the product in, a, in, a, in an efficient way, uh, in a process that is efficient in the sense that it's cheap and, and, and produces uh, high, in, in high speeds and, and high quantities, but then at the end you tune that product so that it fits the, the customer. Uh, we usually do not see customi uh, customized shoes, although there is this possibility and it will appear, uh, some of the, the, the authors here will be mentioning um, the way, for example, Nike in the 90s was already exper experimenting with what became later Nike ID, that was Nike personalized, well, personalized, customized Nike shoes uh, for, for the customers, right? So Nike is an example. Uh, of course, if you go to, the, to, a, to, a, to a shop to buy shoes, uh, Nike shoes, it's going to be whatever they have there off the shelf. But there is a possibility of getting into Nike's uh, web page and helping Nike uh, by customizing your own, own shoes, selecting not only the size, but selecting, selecting colors, selecting sometimes even materials, and receiving these products um, a few, maybe a few weeks later uh, at your home. So this would be more like customization. It's, it's more difficult for us to imagine that in, in shoes, although Nike does that, for example, and other companies have already started uh, customizing, not personalizing. You don't go there and, 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 and have your shoes um, developed for you from, from scratch, but well, the shoes are already there. You, uh, they, they say, well, we, 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 we produce shoes uh, number 10, 10, 10 and a half, 11, or whatever. I'm talking here American measures, but here in Brazil, 38, 40, 42, or whatever. Uh, they already have, they, they, they don't, they, if you want a, your shoes to be 41.3, they, they're going to say, we're sorry. Uh, th that would not be customization, that would be personalization. We can't do that. So you choose among the several possibilities of sizes. And then they, they allow you to do a lot of other, um, let's say, little choices that make you feel like if that was personally made for you. For example, you can choose the color of the laces, you can, you can choose a lot of things there. I remember that one stage, you could even choose, uh, they, they, don't, they don't have that any longer, but at some stage you could, could even choose to have the, shoe, uh, the right shoe one size and the left shoe a different size. That would help me because I have, I never know which one, but I have one, one foot that is a little uh, larger than the other, and I always, whenever, I, whenever I, I try shoes, I have to try both feet because if I try only one, it may be well. This is really nice, and then when I get home, the other, the other foot is either too tight or too, too large, depending if I was lucky to get the, the big foot or the small foot, right? But anyway, even that you could do, but it was customization, little changes. But notice what happens. Do we already have uh, uh, collective intelligence in, in customization? Sure, we do, because the customer is interacting with the company and, and providing information. Uh, specific to his or her own needs or his or her own uh, interests, right? And that makes a difference in the sense that the, the, the company starts understanding better who the customers are individually, which is important because we can create value for individuals, but also as a, a crowd. Uh, for example, one of the reasons that in the other paper that you had to read for today, the Makina said that Levi's in the 1990s, decided to 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 build personal, per, not personalized, customized jeans. Maybe I'll have to discuss that together with this paper here already because uh, it fits here. It's a, that, that's that's customization, right? Uh, you go to a to, to a department store uh, with the help what the with uh, of the attendant, you you get your measures taken. You maybe you, you, you see the products that they have there, the jeans that they have there, the colors, and you say, well, I like this color better, or, uh, I like this texture better, or whatever. All of that gets into a specification that goes to the factory. The factory manufactures your, your jeans to your, to your size, specifically to your size. You, you, you get a, a product that was, let's say, made to order, precisely the, the way you, you wished. Um, and again, I usually have a problem when I buy jeans. Uh, it's either uh, too short because I'm too tall. I'm, I'm taller than, than than the models that are probably used for 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 uh, for, for, for jeans. Uh, or my waist is too uh, is, is 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 too. Let, let's say that the jeans is too loose on the waist because I'm let's say I'm I'm longer than I'm fatter right? in the sense that uh, so it's very difficult for me to, to 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 do that if I go to a shop. If I had the possibility of buying uh, 
what uh, Levi's was experimenting in the 90s, that would be uh, probably a, a, a good business proposition for me because I would know that the jeans would feed my waist and would also feed my, the length of my legs. Right? Uh, and by knowing what, what, what fits Alex, uh, the, the company also starts knowing what would fit other customers that are similar to Alex. Uh, most of you have probably studied uh, statistics at some stage in your lives. You know those number, uh, magic numbers like, well, after you have, let's say, some 30 people with uh, some, uh, in, in a sample, uh, you start already being able to guess what happens to the rest of the population. Right? Uh, so I do believe that uh, this device project in the 90s, they were interested in, in, in doing dynamic customization, not, not necessarily to provide customers with a better value proposition. They were, what they wanted to do was collect users' information that could help them even decide, decide or, and, and, and improve their, their, their procedures, their processes, to be more efficient with the rest of the population that did not use the customized services. Right? Those customized services, in the 90s, maybe nowadays this is, is becoming, now this is more economically feasible. In the 90s, possibly that was, I mean, it was not that uh, Levi's would decide, from now on, I don't sell jeans any longer through department stores. I will only sell them through my websites because I can then make to order and, 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 and make sure that customers get exactly what they, they, they need. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and at the same time, I do not have to spend money with, uh, with the, the department stores that reap part of the, the profits, right? Uh, that was not their intent. Uh, I believe that their, 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 their intent was, well, I know that producing customized products at this stage two is still more expensive than keep doing the efficient thing of providing everyone with the same products. But if I do this for a sample of the population, I will be able to improve my processes to deliver um, to the other markets that are still mass consumption markets. Right? Uh, this may still be the case in many, for, for many industries. Right? You, you may want to treat a few customers or, or attract a few customers to provide you with information that can help you even in, the, in, the, in your traditional way of building or, or developing your products. But this uh, possibility that technology allowed it here for, digital, uh, for dynamic customization provided with this collective intelligence. At that stage, there were a few um, uh, authors that start talking about collected intelligence. Uh, I even uh, had a, a paper that I wrote together with a few students a few years ago in which we said there's a difference between, and, and of course, uh, being Latin American uh, uh, researchers, uh, whatever we do here does not have the same impact in the, let's say, we don't get published in, in the slow management, slow management, slow management journal. Uh, but, but we thought that maybe one little difference that we could do already in our collective intelligence uh, discussions was introducing another term that would be collective intelligence. Because the collective intelligence is, of course, I am benefiting, it's, it's part of collective intelligence, but it's, it is, I involve the customers in the way that I collect data from them, and then I use it, and I or my systems use that, in, that, that, not, that, that data to build intelligence in a solo way, alone, right? We don't involve the collective in, we don't involve the collective in the intelligence part of what, what we're doing. We collect data, and, 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 and that collected data uh, helps us build something more intelligent. Uh, maybe uh, we could say that Waze, uh, and uh, I don't know if Google Maps does the same, but Waze I'm sure that does that, that collects information from, from uh, its users all the time, right? Uh, humans become, um, let's say, um, collecting points of data that helps them improve the suggestions that they give back to those same uh, customers afterwards. The customers some of us would say, well, the customers are not involved in, in collective intelligence because they're not thinking together, but they're providing data. Uh, they, they, they're a tool, in the, in this, at least in this collected intelligence process. Right? See, again, uh, the, the collected intelligence as a, an expression, it is something that we try to coin a few other authors. I saw it a few times uh, in, the, in, in discussions in, in collective intelligence, but it has not been a term that was coined in a way that everyone uses it. Do you notice that there's a difference between, maybe, it's a, a collected intelligence is a subgroup of collective intelligence. So this dig, uh, uh, dynamic customization would definitely uh, be a way of collecting data that could be turned into more intelligent products, into products that would provide more value, for example. 
right? Of course, there is also some, you know, you could, you could argue that, well, but you know, when the, the, the customer is, is, gets involved in dynamic customization, in fact, part of the value that is being created is already being co-created. So there's also some collective intelligence in that sense of building together happening there. It's the customer and the systems uh, that are provided by the, the, the organization that uh, together build a product that has more value. So building value is a result of collective intelligence here. So notice how, you know, the whole thing is fuzzy. There, there's, there is collective intelligence, uh, there's the possibility of having just collected intelligence. Customers include some info there, and this info is used so that smart people in the organization make decisions. But at the same time, there's also part of the process that is the, the, the users directly helping uh, get what they want. And then I say, uh, do we need technology necessarily to, to, to obtain this customization? Not necessarily. For example, a, a supermarket is, uh, uh, a, 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 as a concept, the concept of, a, of a, a supermarket is a concept of collective intelligence in the way that someone in the past who had uh, one of those warehouses where there was a bench here, customers came, I was, let's say, if I was the seller, I would be behind the bench, all the merchandise, all the products would be behind me, and the, per the, the, the customer would ask, uh, I want uh, uh, a kilo of coffee, I want uh, some wheat, and I want uh, sugar, and this and that, and I would have to pick that from the wall. Suddenly, someone thought, I can, uh, if, I, if I get this bench out of here, and instead of being the collector of uh, all those products for, the, for each customer, if I stay there close to the, 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 the let's say, the, the door, and just check what they, 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 they collected by themselves uh, at the end, I can uh, uh, just ch ch uh, charge them at the end and, and, and build a different model in which I turn the customer, the, 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 the consumer, into the producer of his own uh, consumption experience. Uh, in the 90s, uh, we started uh, coining uh, a term, we, 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 I mean, not me, uh, the you know, the literature started coin, uh, coining uh, I, uh, the term prosumer, that is the producer, the, the, the consumer that also becomes the producer, right? So, uh, nowadays we don't think about going to the supermarket as being a prosumer experience, but we are actually producing something as consumers, picking all the products, putting them in the basket, and, and, and taking them to the, to the cashier is already, let's say, uh, it, it is something that in the past was done by an attendant, right? So the, the, the company transferred to us um, part of what used to be its own, uh, its own effort. Now we put that effort in with uh, advantage for everyone. It became cheaper for the, for, for the vendor, for, for whoever was selling, because uh, uh, the company doesn't need to, to do that work any longer, the customer does it. it became, possibly the, 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 the purchasing experience became less expensive than also, it, it, as, as it became cheaper for the producer, uh, maybe it's part of that benefit can be transferred to the customers, right? And, and so it became less expensive for, for the customers. Uh, and there are other advantages. The, the customer, uh, when, I mean, if I, if I go to a warehouse and I ask for coffee, I cannot, wait there and, and, and in front of a shelf of all different possibilities, of all different brands choosing among themselves, um, among the different possibilities, the guy's going to say, hurry up, there's a queue of people there, you want coffee, get this one, right? Now, now I can go to the supermarkets and, uh, and uh, be there in front of a shelf for an hour, deciding among two or three different products that are, are available. Uh, and so I, I, I also, I as a customer, may, may value that, right? May value the fact that now I have more, um, Let's see, the, the products will fit what I really need uh, or wish more than, than in the past. Okay. So there's, there's customization, is, uh, but, but of course technology helps a lot here. Okay. Uh, so I gave you the example of the supermarket as, as being prior to, to, to examples that are cited in our papers here. Uh, Levi's, Dell, what other companies appear there in our texts uh, that, that, that did dynamic, dynamic customization or something similar to that? I remember Makina, Makina definitely cites Dell and and, and Levi's as, as examples there. Do you remember, remember any other? Well, why you think uh, we, a second vector was asset configuration. Uh, if the first vector was thinking about a virtual encounter with the customer, uh, asset configuration is, uh, let's say, a virtual encounter with 
the suppliers, right? I can also use technology, see again the digital transformation ha happening here, to source modules to suppliers. Instead of doing everything myself, I can uh, build a modular product and then uh, have different uh, suppliers being uh, in charge of different modules. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, Luciano is saying that uh, Makina also talked about IBM. Uh, I, I, IBM became, a, let's say, a, an example that it, it's more difficult for us to bring from the 90s to now because IBM is a company that, diff, uh, that, that definitely changed itself a lot over the, over the last 100 years, right? When we think about Levi's, everyone still understands Levi's makes jeans, right? When we talk about Dell computers, well, it doesn't make uh, computers any, uh, or at least uh, computers are, are, are not, let's say, their main uh, focus any longer. But we still relate to the fact that they, 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 they were PC builders uh, that for, for quite a while, and if you, wrote, if you read the interview with Michael Dell, you noticed uh, that he was very focused in developing dynamic customization. In fact, it, it seemed that, of course, uh, the, the interview with, with uh, Makina, sorry, with, with Michael Dell, happened about the same time. I think that paper was published also in 1998, uh, at the Harvard Business Review. But we can very easily see dynamic customization happening there. The customer choosing the items that would, uh, that would uh, comprise the product the customer was buying. Uh, at the same time, you see a lot of this sourcing. Remember, how, how does uh, how the sourcing happened with, uh, with Dell. Uh, one, one interesting thing that he says in the interview is that at that stage, 1998, 1999, uh, Dell uh, uh, saw, uh, well, bought its, its monitors from Sony, and Sony had a, a factory in Mexico, right? So Dell had its factory in, in Texas, um, so it built the computers in Texas, but it had at least the supplier of the, 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 the monitor was Sony in Mexico, and the, the, the Sony monitor never came to Texas. It went straight to the, to the city where the customer was. And, and when, it, when it arrived there, uh, there was another supplier, let's say a third party supplier here, a, and let's say an aggregator, who would get the monitor coming from Mexico, the, the computer coming from Texas, when they, they were all together there, this uh, uh, other, the other, let's say, um, um, participant of the of, of, of uh, Dell's um, network would uh, get the computer and the monitor and take it to the to, to the user's home and install it for the customer, right? But this uh, guy that would go to, to to the customer's house, which I think it was DHL, I'm not sure if I don't, don't recall if it, it's one of these uh, uh, um, companies that do deliveries. Uh, they would go to the customer's house wearing a shirt with. Dell's logo on it, because Dell wanted uh, uh, not only to, to, to have its products made of moduled, uh, modules that were sourced from different suppliers, it also provided the, this process interdependency. It, wanted, it thought, well, the customer, is not, the customer should not know that each of uh, different firms does a little bit of the, the thing. For the customer, it's always Dell, right? To make it simpler, because if the customer bought their computer from Dell, it's Dell that will deliver it to, to, to the customer, and if the customer has any problems, he, will, he or she will talk to Dell, right? Even if Dell is, in fact, uh, DHL or, or some other um, logistics provider at the, at the end, right? So, uh, Dell is a company that takes uh, uh, this uh, second uh, vector here, that is the, the vector that is concerned with the suppliers, the supply side of the value chain, and, and brings it all the way to what uh, Venkat Truman and Henderson call resource collision. A resource collision is uh, some, some sort of or, or organization made up of several other companies or firms that work in a very interconnected way and in a way that uh, if, if you look at it, if, if a Martian came to Earth and tried to observe that organization, this, uh, this alien would say it's one only organization. It would be difficult to see any boundaries among those uh, organizations. This is possible because of technology. But, uh, so, so th this is why these guys were discussing this in, in information systems in, in the 90s. But this also allows us for a lot of collective intelligence to, ha to happen among the company itself, its suppliers, uh, and those customers that are doing dynamic customization. Notice, dynamic co customization is only possible if we have modules. Because customizing something means assembling in a slightly different uh, way. 
not producing the whole uh, product in a personalized way, right? So uh, uh, many times people explain this, uh, uh, referring to a legal, uh, you know, the legal toy that kids play with. Uh, several little parts you can build whatever you want out of that. But well, you cannot build whatever you want because it's customization. It's not personalization. If you want to build a truck, it will. You will build a truck, but uh, you can only build a truck based on the, the modules that you have. The idea of uh, having uh, modular products is that that allows for a much easier dynamic customization. Um, Dell could do uh, dynamic customization. Apple would never be able to do it because Apple did not source its modules. Right? Of course, nowadays it does in the sense that uh, it's, it's a manufacturer in, in, in China that does something and uh, they do that, but they do, don't do it in, a, in, a, in the same way as Dell. Dell, for example, got to the extreme that Michael Dell said, we do not want to be uh, the, the manufacturers of any of the parts that we, that we build into our, our computers. We're going to be just assemblers because by being assemblers, we're not too uh, connected. So for example, if, if, if Dell built its own uh, or, or produced its own hard drives, I, I mean magnetic hard drives, when uh, flash memories started becoming uh, an alternative in terms of price and, and much faster and everything, Dell would still look at its own manufacturing plant of, of magnetic drives and say, well, but we still have to use our drives here because we built this large factory. Uh, understand that uh, if, if, if you do everything uh, inside your own organization, you're much less flexible to changes that happen uh, in, the, in the environment, uh, technological changes, for example. So Dell what is that he, he says in the, in, in the interview? He says, I prefer to watch a, a horse race and then pick the, 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 the winning horse after the horse wins than betting uh, on, on, on the horse beforehand. Right? Betting on the horse would be probably betting that he or his company could do better than others. So he said, his idea was, if Sony produces the best uh, monitors, I will buy them from Sony. If uh, whatever other company is the, the, the company that, that has the, the let's say the, the best um, um, I don't know hard drives, for example, I'll buy from them. While that is what my customers want, because if the customers start deciding, well, I'm, I'm, you know, the customer may say, I'm happy to pay 50 bucks more for a flash drive than for a, a magnetic uh, hard drive. You know, he will. Uh, the company will start seeing this preference happening much before uh, others that push products to the market. When you, I mean, if you sell your your computer, the idea. I'm, I'm back there in the in the 90s in Dell's reality, right? Uh, if uh, at that stage, Michael Dell produced a whole computer and sent it to, to, a re uh, to, to a retail shop to sell, he would see that most of those computers would sell. He would never know if people were buying those because it was their only option. Oh, it, or because it was what they really needed. So notice that this, this, this thing of uh, providing this or, or building this resource coalition, uh, which is really, if you, for, for those who read the, 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 the paper, res the resource coalition is the extreme to which you can get to process interdependence when it works perfectly, when, when there's no noise in the, in the, in, in, in the co-work of all those involved. Right? Uh, uh, having these uh, uh, resource coalitions here, you, you, you can build uh, uh, dynamic customization. And look, I have not uh, referred to, to the third stage of customer interaction here because nowadays this is not, we don't talk too much about this any longer. Customer communities. Unfortunately, sometimes our technologies, uh, we shape our technologies, but our technologies shape us also. Remember, for those of you who remember Orkut, Orkut was full of, uh, customer, uh, of people's co of communities, right? When Orkut was replaced by Facebook and other technologies that, that came afterwards, uh, the, the idea of communities of people who had uh, special interests changed uh, a bit at least, right? Of course, you still have, let's say, um, people that gather together uh, an idea or a concept uh, in those technologies, but it's not so community-driven as it, it were in the, in the past. I remember here, for example, that uh, I think it's in um, uh, Makina's uh, paper that he mentions Harley Davidson as a company uh, that explored this idea of customer communities. Because, and customer communities were electronic communities in which people shared their ideas with other people. And McKinnon even said, 
the company doesn't even have to be officially there. It doesn't have to be a, a, a community that is sponsored by the company. Just check what's happening on the web, for example. Of course, in, in, in 1995, it was difficult to say check on the web because the web was a desert, right? But the idea was that, that try to make sure that you foster these communities to be created, but don't, don't make them a, uh, I don't know how to say that in, in English, or, or say, don't make it a chapa branca community. Chapa branca means here in Brazil, we, we, we have cars. Uh, that, that used to, in the past, that used to be, uh, when all, all our plates, the, the plates of cars were all yellow in Brazil, they're, they're, they're white now, but when they were all yellow, the, 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 the blank, or the, the, the white plates were for official cars, for cars that belonged to the government, for example. And we, and we have this expression that we call Chapa Branca, something that is official. So, if I build, for example, I mean, we have an official uh, community for this group here. Uh, it is our WhatsApp group, right? But it's official. The professor is there. So, of course, it, it is going to be used in, in ways that you know that uh, consider that the professor is there. If you had a WhatsApp group that was only among yourselves, the discussions that would happen there would be possibly different. For example, my, my son just, uh, was just um, uh, selected uh, here. At, uh, he's going to be one of our students in the undergraduate information systems project here at UTFPR. Uh, uh, of course, we as professors, we know a little bit about uh, what happens in the, in the course from the student's perspective because we hear things sometimes in the corridors, uh, we hear sometimes a complaint uh, or, uh, from, from a student about uh, another professor or sometimes uh, a student saying, well, that, the, the, the class of that other professor is great. So we, we have some sort of impression of, uh, of how the course goes uh, based on, on the student's uh, perception of it. But it's not as good as if we were inside the, 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 let's say, the community of uh, students. I know they have their own, the, the students have their own groups, right, in which they discuss things. Well, the, the other day my son, of course, he's a, one of these, uh, he's a very serious student, his, his class has only started in a couple of, uh, I think it's next week that they, they will start the first semester, but he was already checking everything, and he already knew a lot of things about a lot of professors, and he came to me and said, ha, your students here are saying that your class to, to pass your class, you, you just have to do all the readings, and uh, and uh, if you if you come uh, and, and if you watch the videos from previous semesters, that's okay. You don't have to worry too much. It's an easy course. People just have to read and and, and, and watch the, the the videos from previous semesters. Uh, and I said, well, how do you know that? Well, it's the colleagues say and say to that. I never I never knew that they were that they I should have suspected because I teach this right. I, if I were the the coordinator of the course, I would say I want to be a fly on the wall in that group, right? Uh, well, now there are some undergrads here. Now watch out! Now I have a fly on the wall. Uh, sometimes, if my, my son tells me anything at home, now now no, of course he's, he's probably not going to tell me things that uh, that the let's say the the community uh, feeling uh, doesn't uh, allow to. But I had more information about my colleagues uh, and and myself over the last week or two through the the, the information that my son was getting from this community of of the students. Then I probably got in the last 20 years. Again, I'm not the coordinator of the course. I'm not uh, someone who, who's involved with that. But what Makina says is, make sure you're there. Make sure that you know what your students are. Uh, sorry, your, your community is doing. Make sure what the good things that they're talking about you are, and also the bad things. Not to go there and punish anyone, but to take the measures that allow you to improve. As a matter of fact, when I was a, a, a professor at Universidade Positivo. Uh, Again, some 15 years ago, uh, I had a, 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 um, the coordinator of one of the courses that I taught there. Every time I got to his room at break time or whatever, I had to talk to, to him. I always saw he was always, and, and, and it, it has to be some, at least 15 years ago because it, he was always on Orkut. And I remember that once I, I got there and said, don't you work? Do, do you only? And then he, he showed me exactly that, you know what I'm doing here? I'm checking uh, Orkut and, 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 and finding out where students are. The, the, they had dozens of communities of students of different semesters and whatever. And I'm, I'm trying to, to see where I can get into, into, into groups as if I were a student because I want to see what they're talking about. Because if I go to class, if, 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 I, if I get to a classroom and ask people, do you have any complaints, anything that you want to, me to know? Or, it's going to be that there will be some, something, but it's going to be different things. So think of the importance of these uh, uh, customer communities or as a collective intelligence tool. Right? Um, of course, uh, I, I was sort of skipping this because our technology didn't move 
that much in that that way. But if we are creative, we can we can go that way. Yeah. The would be Hikloni Aki, uh, customer community. Uh, well, Hikloni is uh, of course uh, uh, customers only go there to to complain about something. Uh, it's definitely something that companies should pay a lot of attention, and it's definitely a, a a tool from which you can extract collective intelligence that you wouldn't get otherwise, right? Uh, so it is a, but I wouldn't say that it's exactly a, com a co community. Is a place where people go and, and they they they're always there. And economic people go and they're pissed off and they they want to complain about something. And and probably that complaint has already gone to. Uh, we would expect that it would, would have already gone to the to the to the company before through other means. And the customer still feels that uh, you know not enough attention was paid to, to his or her case. But it definitely that's I would say economic key is a place. That should be monitored for collective intelligence, or to, to see what the mood is about your products. If, if your company is a company that appears a lot in in the key, uh, you're probably not doing things right, right? And and besides, uh, you will probably uh, uh, th that will go against your business because many people these days, before they buy a product, they check places like uh, Reclame Key. Uh, for those who are not uh, aware of uh, Reclame Key, this is a Brazilian uh, website where if you have a complaint uh, that you could not get directly solved with a company, you go there, you, you actually you complain publicly, publicly there, and then the, the company also has the opportunity to either to solve your problem or to at least show that, um, the, that uh, the company has a different perception of that situation uh, and that it, 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 therefore it's not going to solve it the way the customer wants. Right? Uh, we usually say that the, the customer is king, right? the, the customer should but, but we know that there are customers and customers, and there are customers that definitely uh, do, do not, de uh, unfortunately, do not res uh, deserve the respect that they are, they are demanding. Uh, also, right? So, the, the, the idea, the concept that the, the, the customer is king uh, uh, should, should mean that we should empower the customer, we should trust the customer, but we should also be aware that there are cases where, well, no, this is going a little too, too far. The other day, my my, my wife, who's a, a professor at uh, the Catholic University, uh, well, she manages a course there, and she, was, she, she had to deal with a student, or I should say a consumer, who was complaining about uh, the university on Reclame Aqui. And I said, gee, I, I, but it's, thank God I'm in a public university where I would say, I will not even bother, right? Uh, but of course, they, they do have, I say, this is not a consumption uh, relationship. This is definitely something that should be solved somewhere else, and besides, then in a very quick uh, uh, investigation in Reclame Aqui, she noticed that the same student had already complained about seven other institutions. It was a, a one of these, um, um, uh, how, do, how do you call it, a, a specialization courses, and the person had done, had gotten into several, several other of those before, and complained about, well, I don't know if they complain, the person complained about all of them, but there were complaints about seven different institutions. And I said, look, if they had looked at that, let's call it a community, Hekloniaki, but if they, if they had looked at that before accepting the student, they would say, no, we don't want you to be our, our student. We know, we know that there's still, you know, there's still a lot of other universities uh, that you can complain about before coming and complaining about, uh, about us. You know, I mean, it, it, it's an important source of knowledge. When we talk about collective intelligence, we're always talking about, again, is it intelligence that we're talking about? Many times we, we want to build better, better knowledge to take better decisions, right? So it's not only about, uh, see, see how broad the, the term collective ends up being, right? Uh, if I knew, for example, in fact, I, I, I have already done something similar to that a few years ago uh, when we were recruiting students for, for our, our master's uh, program here. Before we had interviews with the, the students, well, an interview is part of the, of the process. I thought, Let's me, let me Google these guys, right? And check, and I mean, it, this is all part. Google is this, uh, well. Google is a, a, a is definitely a a collective intelligence uh, source. Uh, somehow, it, 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 it is also the result of collective intelligence process because we all help by means of our own uh, searches. Uh, we help improve the algorithm and, and make sure that others who search similar items get better results because of our searches or because not not because of our searches, but mainly because of because of the links that we included in in the websites that we wrote or whatever. Um, but uh, uh, this uh, uh, the simple a simple check made me include a few uh, questions uh, to be asked to, to, to the potential to the candidates 
that I thought that would help us in our decision making. Right? It is a decision making process that you have to, to make and, uh, and many times uh, you have information that is available uh, and that I believe should be used. It's, it, each time it's becoming more difficult to be uh, to, to do these things because uh, 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 well, the, the, the process of, 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 of doing a selection and, and everything uh, um, is, uh, is, is changing in a way that we not, not, I wouldn't do it today but I, do, I still think that we, we make better decisions if we, 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 we go like that. You know? Yep. Uh, do you know business intelligence? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a, a relationship between... Business uh, intelligence and collective intelligence? Yes. Uh, uh, business intelligence, uh, we collect yeah. uh, data to make information. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You start... Well, there's always in, 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 in computing, we, we, we say that we start from data and then we, we get data and then from that data we, we organize it and then that becomes information. And then we try to organize information or make sense of information to get uh, knowledge, right? Uh, and, and sometimes uh, it's called, it could have been uh, also called uh, business knowledge. They called it uh, business intelligence. Uh, and again, it, that's another area where I believe that still it would be good if we improve the quality of the expressions that we use. But of course, that's something that takes a long time because it's not a matter of someone saying, well, from now on, this is going to be the term that we are going to use for that. You know, languages don't work like that. And we're building language when we, we, we do that, right? But I would say that knowledge, uh, uh, sorry, uh, BI, uh, BI uses collective intelligence as a tool many times. Of course, BI does not depend only on data that is uh, obtained through business intelligence. But part of it can definitely be uh, through through business intelligence, and so through through collective intelligence. Uh, and now, and we have a third vector here that I haven't talked about yet: uh, knowledge leverage. Because this is, I'd say, this is he, he, uh, the authors could have called this the the, the collective intelligence uh, uh, vector, right? Because what they want with this uh, with this vector here is to make sure that. The, all the, 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 well, all the data, all the information, and all the knowledge of people involved in the, the process are somehow collected and turned into value. Right? Turned into value for the organization itself or for its customers. Uh, I mean, turned, turned into value that can be shared with, with customers. Right? Uh, and then uh, they claim that there is a, a, you know, a knowledge that can be obtained from, more based on, on a work unit expertise, that is those people that are directly involved uh, on the process at the organizational level and uh, uh, and uh, and in you know, and outside the, the, the organization, right? Uh, although this is the the vector that would deal with collective intelligence, because you know there are several different collectives here, right? The, the collective that is more um, work units related. Work unit is let's say the the department or those directly involved, uh, the, the, the the company as a whole, uh, or a, a larger group here. I, I always found that this was the, the part of the paper that was explained in a, in a blurrier way. It's not, it was not so clear to, to understand that. This to me, right? I don't know the impression that you had, but uh, I know that they noticed that there was a lot of potential here, but at the same time, I had the feeling that this uh, potential could have been explored better. And, and my, uh, uh, my understanding for why it is uh, blurrier, it's because maybe, I mean, we have to understand that these guys were talking about these things 20 years ago, right? Uh, they, they were talking about dynamic customization. Many companies haven't gotten to that even today. They were talking about resource collision. I would say that very few companies uh, got to this, although many companies today work in a connected way with their suppliers, but there's still, there's still, th this process uh, interdependence here is still very problematic. Many times, see, see what happened with uh, most of the supply chains around the world during the p pandemic. Of course, the pandemic was a chaotic and nobody could have forecasted it. Uh, but we noticed that this process interdependence here, well, they were interdependent and one of them failed and everyone else failed. So it was a, a, a process a process interdependence that didn't have enough, um, how would you call, um, flexibility to, 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 to change or to adjust to a new uh, unexpected situation. Uh, Carla, uh, can, can you can you elaborate on that a little bit?
Ya. Yep. If you think, for example, uh, uh, Hesius Makiena, the, the author of the other paper, I'm, I'm using this uh, paper here, we're spending most of the time, in fact, we're, we're spending the whole time with this paper and, and, and making references to the others because I do think that this uh, model of the three vectors here is still a very good framework for us to think uh, organizations that can, uh, can work much better if they use technology, but if they use technology to enforce the, 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 the knowledge that they can get from their suppliers, the knowledge they can get from their customers, and the knowledge that they can develop the third vector key themselves by making sure that they connect all these uh, different uh, um, uh, participants, let's say, in the in, in the network. Yeah, go on, Maria Vitória. Uh, all, all companies think uh, about uh, profit because, and, and profit is not the, their end purpose. Uh, the end purpose of any any organization is always surviving in the market or, or keeping alive. Uh, many times, when companies think too sh uh, short-sighted on their profits, it is because uh, they, they 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 notice that they realize uh, that uh, the, sh the sh in the short term they're having uh, difficulties in the short term, and if they do not recover. A, a better, let's say, if they, if they don't, do not recover from that, they will not have a long term. So I do believe that there are companies that are short-sighted and, 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 and try to emphasize the possibility of them getting more profit at the short term, but in fact, the, only, the, the ones that do that are either desperate, because they, you know, they, they, that's the only, the only way they can see that they, it's, it's, it's those companies that are, let's say, we have an expression again in Portuguese that I never remember very well, it's uh, uh, sell lunch to buy dinner or something like that, or uh, not. How do you say it in Portuguese? Vendeu almoço para comprar janta, or something like that, right? There are companies that, are, that, that are, have a very short-sighted uh, view. I would say that that uh, tends to be not the, uh, a good approach, because of course, uh, uh, when companies try to extract from the market all the value they can, they're leaving little value for the customers. And the customers may find more value interacting with other with, with other possible suppliers, right? But anyway, uh, so think of this uh, scheme here as uh, ways of building, if we think of the first factor as ways of getting, getting a better understanding of the customers, which means improving uh, your own knowledge based on the knowledge and, and the expectations of the customers. Uh, the second factor has been, well, how can we improve the, the you know, the flow of information with our suppliers to make sure that we get uh, the knowledge that they have of, uh, that, that complements ours into understanding our business uh, better. Uh, and, and finally, this third vector here has been a vector in which you, the, the, the first two are very focused on looking towards the customer, looking towards the suppliers, and this one uh, would be the one making sense of all the the information, the, the, the data, the information, and the knowledge we are able to, to build out of uh, that. Right? Uh, again, notice, if you look, I, I don't know if this paper here, if you can find, uh, control F it and find, uh, maybe it's just a, um, it's, it's just a, a, a camera shot of the, the I don't know, uh, but if I, if you, uh, I'm sure that if you look here for, for the word intelligence or collective intelligence, you won't find it there. Um, and still, uh, you know, all what these guys are proposing by means of their uh, real, uh, the development of real strategies for virtual organizing, the, the proposal of this virtual organization here is an attempt to build better knowledge uh, for, for the company's own decisions with the expectation that uh, this could provide more value for itself and for its customers. Okay. All right, uh, well, I, you know, to talk, by talking about Vicka Truman and Henderson, I mentioned uh, uh, 
Makina several times. Makina is a marketing guru uh, who thought that we, and basically I would say that we had to summarize the ideas of, I'm trying to, let's see if I can, uh, uh, if we have to summarize Makina's ideas, we would say that his paper proposes that uh, one builds a dialogue with customers. Uh, of course, the idea, as, as Carla told us, uh, marketing is not about uh, advertising products. Uh, it, it's partially about that, but uh, advertising products is the old school in the sense that uh, it's, it's very industrial revolution oriented, right? Uh, someone produces a product, puts it to the market, and then says, well, now I have to find customers. And then they try to promote that, that, that product and convince customers that that's what customers want. Uh, building a dialogue helps companies understand what the customers want so that they can change the products or, or, or tune their products to those uh, customer uh, wishes and needs. Okay? And this is the main, so the, the, the main focus of Makina's uh, paper is on building this dialogue with customers in order to better understand them, better understand their needs, and, and therefore collect their knowledge, collect their intelligence, and, 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 and bring this uh, to the organization. I had uh, uh, told you that if you wanted to skip, uh, because I, I know there's always a, a lot of reading, uh, and, I, and of course I, I really wish, I mean, we're doing this in, 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 in English, this is already a barrier for, for, for the Portuguese speaking, right? Uh, but this is also a possibility for, for, and this is also a barrier for our Spanish speaking, we have at least uh, three or four people that have Spanish as their first language in our class. Uh, and. Uh, I don't, in fact, I said, I said we, we had, I think then we have some, someone who only who speaks German here as their first language. So uh, we have this, this challenge of doing this in a foreign language for most of us uh, and, 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 and also reading in a foreign language and everything. So sometimes you have to skip one thing or, or, or the other, but I wish you read as much as you can uh, so from, from, the, from the, the papers that I'm proposing here so that you, you, you get under, understanding what this means. And I had told you. Uh, maybe if you had to, to skip anyone, I would skip Nambisa and Nambisa for for a reason. I do, I, I think that Nambisa and Nambisa get uh, they, they're, they're 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 building the dialogue. They're they're going the same way as Makina, uh, and uh, only they're doing that some 15 years later, 13 years later. Uh, and 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 in this case, they are more um, they're providing us more. Of their research in terms of we even notice that some of the procedures, although they, they, again this paper is not uh, an academic paper in the sense of showing the research itself, we can figure out what the research was. We know their their questions and everything. But they are, they, basically, what they propose here is that we can get customers involved in, in building a dialogue. We can we, we can get customers involved in the conception of uh, our products or services, in the development of our products or services, uh, in the advertising of our products and services. Uh, in the in the correction or the fixing or the bug uh, you know elim elimination of bugs in our products uh, so so they they, they look at the, the several activities in which organizations uh, build uh, value and they, they they think how can we invite and include customers in this uh, value creation uh, activities uh, one interesting thing uh, to me in this paper is that they didn't uh, mention the customer as being someone who produces the product. And uh, we do have several examples of companies nowadays that have the customer even producing the product, right? Uh, and uh, well, and then many times they, they not only produce the product, they, they become the product themselves, right? But for example, if we think of some of our, our social networks, uh, the company basically provides an infrastructure, but uh, what, what we are, what customers, or let's say what users are, want there is the content, but who produces the content? The customers themselves, right? So I found really amusing that, that uh, Nambisa and Nambisa did not include the customers as the actual producers or the possibility of actually producing the, the products. Another interesting thing here, the, the prosumers, exactly. Uh, another, which the same prosumers that had already been deployed by, by uh, I think, Aldous uh, Huxley and, and, and others in the 90s, uh, they appear here in the Nambisa and Nambisa paper. And, and of course, uh, some companies, uh, another in interesting thing that I noticed about this paper and, and of any intention of companies including customers is that each company has to figure out what is the main, the, the, the most suitable way of involving its customers in, in, in a 
let's say, in co-creating something or, or in co-producing something. Uh, the examples that they give here, for example, they say that Microsoft, uh, Microsoft involves customers in, uh, in the, I have not mentioned that, but uh, they also say that customers sometimes are used as support, uh, to, to provide support to, to, to other customers, right? Microsoft does that in, in, in at least uh, in the example that they give here, this paper. Microsoft uses some customers to provide other customers with technical support. For example, if you have a problem with one of their products, you get into one of those their forums, uh, and then there is going to be someone to support you there, and that person is not going to be uh, uh, a, an employee by Microsoft. Uh, it's going to be another customer who will help you with your problem, and then, uh, of, of course, that person does that because they think that by, by they will end up, if, if, if they are considered good supporters, they will end up being mentioned by Microsoft as Microsoft value partners or whatever. Microsoft doesn't pay them a thing, but Microsoft gives them a title, let's say, uh, and they are interested in that title because with that title they can then propose their, 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 their services to others that will pay for it. So it's interesting that uh, Microsoft has a, a business proposition in which it uses the the labor of its customers for free, but it provides them with uh, an acknowledgement of that uh, that helps them get some money from the markets then, not from, from Microsoft. Right? Uh, and another curious thing about the way Microsoft does that is that to, to assess the quality of the support that is being given, Microsoft also uses collective intelligence. So they use the collective, this collective intelligence, this collective labor of, uh, of users, uh, supporting other users, and then they use the users that are being supported as crowd evaluators of those who are providing them with, with the support. So let's say if, if you went there and you asked for, for some support, you received that support, then you say, well, this guy who just gave me support here deserves a thumbs up or deserves a five stars or whatever. And based on the assessment that other users perform of those users that are the supporters, let's say, the, the prosumers there, Microsoft gives them the, the title of Microsoft value partner or whatever. So notice they're using collective, uh, the, they're, they're using the crowds twice. They use the crowds to provide some uh, uh, some work that in the past had to be performed by their own employees. And they use the crowds to assess the quality of the service that is pro being provided by, by other customers. Um, Microsoft uh, 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 involves customers in this uh, situation uh, in, in, in in collective intelligence, we say that many times people say, say that people work for love, money, or glory. Right? Nambisa and Nambisa, I think uh, they claim that, uh, let me just copy here. Nambisa and Nambisa have a slightly different uh, dimension for that, uh, slightly different dimensions. They say that people, the reasons for people to do or to, to help are, I think it's here. People do things for usability reasons, for sociability, for pragmatic benefits that they can get, or for hedonic reasons. Hedonic reasons is for sort for, for fun, okay? Uh, so they, uh, for, for, for Malone and the MIT people, they say love, love, glory, or money. Uh, these guys here, uh, I would say that hedonic, or the, 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 for fun, that's love, not well because the love would be love for, for others, love for what what you're doing or whatever, right? So this this baskets of things are again very open, but uh, I, would, I would say that hedonic would be in the other uh, categorization would be love. Usability uh, may be uh, uh, it's very pragmatic. So if you're doing something because because of uh, I think that these two could pro probably be for equivalent to money. And socialism, sociability could be maybe law, uh, for, for glory. I don't know, for, you know, you want to, others to think good about you. I don't know. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to show here is uh, I said that Microsoft was concerned, on, concerned about uh, well, involving people for, I'd say, for, for money. I don't know if I already showed sure this. Uh, but there are other, other companies here. For, for example, they talk about Ducati. Ducati is that. Uh, I, I, I don't know exactly where, where that is in the paper now, but Ducati is a motorcycle company from from Italy. That the same way, way as it happened with Harley Davidson, mentioned by 
Makina, you got a paper. Ducati is a, a company that the customers, its, its customers are very loyal and they love the brand. So for a company uh, that has customers that love the brand, you don't go there and invite them, do you want to be my uh, support? I, I can assure you that those supporters of Microsoft, it's not because they love the brand, it's because they, they have a very pragmatic benefit. They say, well, if I support others, Microsoft is going to, to consider me a Microsoft value partner, and then I can make more money out of that. Ducati cannot ask its customers, do you want to make some bucks? Do you want to get some money out of uh, helping me? And the, the, the customers are going to say, I would help you for free because I love the brand. So how, how does Ducati involve its customers? It involves its customers in the concept of, okay, considering that you love the, the, the brand, would you like to be part of a forum in which we will discuss new products for the future? And the guys are going to say, sure, I'll do that for love. Right? I love. Perceive that different companies are going to be able to engage customers differently depending on how they, 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 they propose themselves to the market. Right? Microsoft is not a, a company that is there to be loved. Right? Uh, I, don't, I don't think that, uh, that, that, that they know that they, I mean, we become, we all, we all become, become prisoners, right? We, uh, I know, now that I know that Carl and some others here are marketing people uh, in, in, in marketing, usually they say that uh, they want to have their customers customers' loyalty. But in fact, most companies, what they get is uh, that they imprison their customers in a way that they lock their customers in and the customers cannot uh, escape them. Right? Uh, so it's in interesting reading. Uh, I, I, as, as I said, I was going to skip this because I thought that although it has many practical examples, it deals with the same topic as Makina. But then when I noticed what uh, the students from last year wrote, I, I kept them in the, in the forum, and uh, many of them said that they liked, this was the paper that they liked the most. Right? So I said, well, I'm, the paper that I'm asking my students to skip now, so let's use collective intelligence, right? It's not what the, the, only the professor's perspective. Uh, some of them said, and, and it was one of the, the, the ones that had more uh, feedback uh, in, in our forum, right? Uh, well, we talked a bit about Magreta, this is the interview with Michael Dell. We didn't talk about open innovation. I will leave uh, open innovation out, considering that it's already time for our our break. I just want to very quickly already show you uh, our forum here. I, as I said, I kept uh, the same forum uh, from the students of last year. Uh, I don't know what, what, what it's saying it's in here, but uh, I oh this no it's it's here. Okay. Uh, so notice there were people that were providing comments on Magreta. which is the interview with Michael Dell. There were a few people that provided comments on Makina, which is the marketing guru who, who was talking about building a dialogue with customers. A lot of people, a lot of interactions here on Nambisan and Nambisan. And then uh, a few more about Minkatraman and uh, notice curiously again, uh, the, the other one that I'm skipping for today's Chasbro's Open Innovation also had more comments here. One thing that we should think of, uh, uh, what we will do after the break, we'll, we'll have a 20 minute break now, but after the break, we'll come back and I will ask you to first read what uh, these colleagues wrote uh, last year and then bring your own insights, maybe comment what, what you liked the most in whatever paper you read, what you disagreed or whatever, because this can start uh, our, our discussion there, right? Um, one interesting thing of uh, when I was thinking over the week now, if I would keep their forum here for us to also discuss with the students of previous years. Of course, they will not be back here and answer, you know, replying to what we say. So, but again, collective intelligence is not something that necessarily needs to happen in real time. In fact, maybe uh, one of one, one very important tool of uh, humans' collective intelligence was uh, writing, because writing, some many thousands year, many thousands of years ago, allowed it for the first time, mankind to store knowledge somehow, right? And, and, and to allow that knowledge could be discussed among people that didn't even live in the same place, neither in the same time. So when we read, for example, when we read Plato these days, uh, and Plato starts his, one of his books uh, telling that his, that his um, master, Socrates, uh, didn't didn't write anything because Socrates didn't like that technology. Uh, we have to thank Plato for have 
decided to write his the ideas of his his master his um, uh, because uh, otherwise we would not know of any any of the ideas of Socrates. Right? Uh, the, the the concerns of Socrates were interesting. Well, Socrates uh, said that he would never write. We, we don't know if he, he he was able to write. Maybe he, he didn't even. But he, he would never write because writing um, uh, avoided uh, uh, or, or avoided the possibility of. Uh, a, 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 a deeper understanding among people because whoever was reading was not in front of the person who wrote so the interpretation would already be different and so same things that we, we nowadays talk about distance learning for example distance education and, and say well we wanted to all be in the same room yeah there's great uh, advantages of being in the same room but there's also great possibilities of not necessarily uh, being in the same room and and saving time in transportation or, or in our case here I know that several people that are uh, online are people from Curitiba, right? But if they saved an additional hour and could read a little more, uh, this is already uh, an advantage. Uh, and besides, it also allows us to have people that are not uh, in, in Curitiba and, and, that, and that can also participate on this. So uh, we can, by, by writing, we can not only talk to people who are contemporary to us, we can talk to people from the past, the students from last semester, uh, and we, we may talk to people in the future if I decide to keep this forum with your comments as well for the students that, ha that, that come next next time, right? So we'll have a, a short break. It's, it's 10, 10, uh, uh, about 10, 10 now. Uh, we come back at 10.30. Uh, in fact, uh, for those of you who are online, if you, if you want to already start getting to each of these items in the, in the forum, it's just a matter of clicking on top of it. Uh, it will have people's comments uh, from uh, from from previous year, you can either if, if you're if you're going to write something uh, in a forum, we can we, we can do things in two levels, right? We, you, you can answer my own, not my own uh, question. Well, my question here was this dash mark, right? I just wrote Magreta ninety eight and didn't include anything because I wanted you to start from scratch, right? So if you want to uh, if you want to answer anybody anybody, for example, if you if you see what Nicoli wrote here last year, and if you want to comment on that, you will reply to to that over here, right? Reply. Uh, but if you want to, 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 to your, your response to be at the same level as Nicolis, or what I mean, if you're starting something from, from scratch, you can reply to my to my uh, to, 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 to my iPhone here, and, and, and that. it's basically a way of making sure that if you're if, uh, that, that you're relating to that, that this works in a coordinated way, right? So if you reply to, to, to me here, it's going to be at the end. If you reply to Nicolis, it's going to be right below. Her, her comments. That, that's, uh, I'm sure that most of you are familiar to, to, to forums, but just to make sure that we get this a little organized, right? So, uh, well, I'll stop recording here. The second part is going to be, we, we, we still, we'll still, of course, we will still be connected here in our Google Meet, so if anyone who's um, uh, remote want to say anything, you can uh, just open your mics. Uh, I'll be checking, um, I'll also be checking the chat here, uh, but our main focus now is spending this next uh, Two hours that we have from 10:30, well, one hour and a half to from 10:30 to to 12. Writing and uh, responding to others or bringing our ideas. Remember that we are all readers. As readers, we are we are let's say we are the writers of our own interpretations. But this is an, a possibility for us to again see what our colleagues would extract from from what they read and see how their interpretations impact us now, considering that uh, each one of us uh, becomes the owner of our own uh, inter. On, on reading, right? Okay, so see you in 10 minutes.